What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Today's episode is going to be brought to you by Mystery Ranch, built for the mission. And if you haven't been rocking a Mystery Ranch Fireline pack for the entirety of your career, well, that sucks to be you, dog, because they make the best damn fire packs in the game. They are also very well known for a ton of other load bearing essentials. Like if you want to go hike the PCT, well, they make a solution for you. If you want to go peel a trophy elk off the side of the hill, well, they make a solution for you. EDC stuff. Sure. Gotcha. Military. Gotcha. They make it all. And they do it damn well. And it's all backed by one of the best damn warranties in the game. So they are located over at www.mysteryranch.com and go over there and check them out right now because they are also giving back to the wildfire community in a huge way. They are the ones responsible for the Backbone Series and the Backbone Series scholarships. So if you have a compelling story and want to share your uh, voice and your story across the world with Mystery Ranch's Backbone Series, you'll have a chance to win one of these $1,000 uh, Mystery Ranch Backbone scholarships. What can you use it for, you might ask? Well, do you want some continuing ed? Do you want to pursue your passions and excel in your career? Do some uh, stuff that's going to be beneficial for your future? Well, that's what that money is going to be used for. So once again, head over to www.mysteryranch.com and check out the Backbone series. And if you want to support these Backbone series scholarships, well, it's easy to do. Just take a look at the three-way briefcase or some of the other packs that they have, like the uh, three-day assault in Wildfire Black. Anything in the Wildfire Black colorway is going to be funneling money back into the boots on the ground that needed the most for those continuing ed, that career development, and all the other storytelling missions that this actually provides. So once again, go over to www.mysteryranch.com. Check it out. This episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is going to be caffeinated by none other than Hotshot Brewery. It's kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. So if you're looking for all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right, or a whole slew of Wildland Firefighter-themed apparel, or just some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, look no further than Hotshot Brewery. You can go find them over at www.hotshotbrewing.com and check this out. There's a little secret hidden page on there. It's not really hidden. It's really in the nav menu, but you can get some uh, Anchor Point merch as well while you're over there. Yeah, they've been supporting the uh, podcast for a hell of a long time. So ever, pretty much ever since the beginning of it. Yeah. But anyways, if you want to find out more, go over to www.hotshotbrewing.com where you can find all of the tools of the trade to get your morning started off right. All of that Wildland Firefighter themed apparel and some kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause. Go check them out. The Anchor Point Podcast is, well, they're not sponsored by, they're not brought to you by, but it is one of those close relationships I have with Bethany over there at the American Wildfire Experience. And uh, yeah, I just want to show her some love for as long as I possibly can because I believe in her cause and I believe in her mission and she's got some rad stuff going on. And if you don't know what the American Wildfire Experience is, well, they house the Smoky Generation. And I know for a fact, a lot of people out there have seen that rolling around. It's pretty freaking awesome. What it is, is basically a digital storytelling platform uh, telling the story of wildland fire. There's quite literally, there's, there has to be like over 250 of these stories out there now, but it's preserving the legacy of the uh, folks in the field and the story of wildland fire. And some of these stories even date back to the 1940s. It's pretty freaking bitching. So if you want a little history lesson, or if you want to sign up for the Smoky Generation grant program, if you got a compelling story and you're telling the story of wildland fire through the lens of a camera, a video camera or a still camera through a blog, through some animations. There was this one dude out there who made uh, we move mountains with spoons and it's freaking kick ass. And they're a smoky generation grant recipient. Yeah. Sky's the limit. Tell the story. It's freaking awesome. Anyways, if you want to find out more, go over to www.wildfireexperience.org and you can check it all out. Once again, www.wildfireexperience.org. Bethany, you have a kick-ass organization over there. Keep it up. The views and opinions of this podcast do not reflect the views and opinions of the United States government, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Defense, the Department of Agriculture, the United States Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or any private, municipal, county, or state firefighting organization, any law enforcement agency, any medical provider, or any contractor employed by any federal agency. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back. Hope everybody's doing well. So 
We are fast approaching the 2024 wildfire season, so I hope everybody has acquired their fitness uh, rather nicely over the course of the winter, and I hope everybody's ready for the upcoming season. Now, let's do a little bit of a call to action before we get into this episode. So, we all know that Congress is just kicking the can down the damn road with the whole WFPPA, the Wildfire Paycheck Protection Act, and Tim's Act, and it's really getting on my effing nerves. Yeah, so there's a handful of people in Congress that are fighting for us. One in particular would be Joe DeGoose, and he's actually introduced legislation, but we need supporters and we need a mass educational campaign to go along with that so we can inform the general public, gain their support, and also educate other uh, Congress uh, (laughs) congressionals that are uh, sitting up there on Capitol Hill that don't really understand what we do. So what I want all y'all to do is... Share the story, share the stories of grassroots, share your story, share the stories of the National Federation of Federal Employees, a.k.a. NIFI, because they're the ones out there leading the charge and uh, making these changes up on Capitol Hill. So let's uh, politely and civilly motivate our congressional members to make a positive difference in wildland firefighters livelihoods. So go over to www.grassrootswildlandfirefighters.com and go over to www.nffe.org so you can join the fight. And yeah, that's pretty much the only announcements that I got. But today's episode is going to be sick. So today on the show, we have Dr. Sasha Berleman. She is going to be the executive director over there at uh fire forward and if you haven't been following her around aka she's also known as the fire poppy she has one kick-ass thing going over there at autobahn canyon ranch so today on the show we're going to talk about fire ecology the importance of prescribed fire what it's like to be uh, a doctor in the wildland fire field and we're going to talk about uh, educating the public on good fire the good fire movement and all things prescribed fire today so Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Dr. Sasha Berleman. Welcome to The Anchor Point. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of The Anchor Point Podcast. Today on the show, I've got Dr. Sasha Berleman, aka The Fire Poppy. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How are you, Brandon? Freaking excellent. I've been trying to get this episode like recorded with you for <laughs> how long now? <laughs> Uh, maybe four years or something like that. It's been a hot <laughs> been minute. A long- yeah. <laughs> so tell yeah. us about yourself. Uh, yeah. Ooh, tell. Okay. It's like a hot shots uh, well, favorite I- question ever. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, well, I, yeah, I'm from Southern California, um, rural Southern California, at least it used to be Temecula. It was like dirt roads and sheep when I was growing up. Now it's massive. I'm from San Diego. East County. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, Look at that. (laughs) Kindred spirits. Yeah. Um, So yeah, that's, that's where I'm from. And uh, I've been working with fire since 2010. Um, And yeah, I started in that practitioner space of like volunteering my time traveling around the U S to get opportunities to light fire and learn about fire in different ecosystems and meet cool people. And then, uh, eventually also did education in fire and then, uh, got out with, uh, writing interagency hotshot crew. And, uh, yeah, here I am. <laughs> what year were you going through, uh, Reading? I first joined Reading just for their actual like fire season part in 2017. And then I came back in 2018 for their full season, the training season and the, um, yeah, actual fire season. And then I've detailed with them almost every summer since I I did one summer where I went with grass, Lake wildland fire module instead for a while. And then last year I didn't get out with them, but hopefully I'll continue to go out once in a while. You got to keep those quals current. (laughs) Yeah. You're doing your own thing though. I mean, you have the ability to keep your own quals current at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's working out, but uh, it's just good experience and good to meet folks on the crew and, um, yeah, see more cool fire. So I love it. Yeah. I, that was one of the times that, uh, I cherish in my fire career now that I'm well out of the game and driving a desk for a living, <laughs> but yeah. uh, the training crews, I, I think they're an underrated thing because you can just like, it's a safe environment to like develop those skills and see some different fire in different areas and 
yeah, it's all walks of life. We have ologists, we have fire personnel, we have fuels people on those crews. Cause I was uh, on Red, uh, Red Mund uh, oh, yeah. in 2016. So pretty parallel oh. in uh, the years that we were on those training crews. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, the the Reading crew really focuses on small unit leadership development too. So there's a lot of leadership training in that crew. And um, I think they, they've they turned out some incredible people who've gone on to do really neat things in their careers. And um, it's just, yeah, irreplaceable experience working on small unit leadership development on a, on a hotshot crew. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure all those skills like, develop into where you're at now with Autobahn Canyon Ranch and all the other stuff that you're doing. It's the skills like they, they kind of last you a lifetime. I have a feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're forever building on them, but that groundwork is just irreplaceable. It's, it's really incredible. And um, yeah, that was, I think a, a massive game changer in my career path. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it was a massive game changer for my career path as well, but now I'm out of the game. So I can't really talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> driving a desk, but it afforded me a lot of opportunities to, you know, develop, take those like small unit leadership tactics and, uh, just the crew cohesion, the, uh, everything to do with leadership and like fire behavior and everything that those programs have to offer and translate it into what I do now. So it's pretty cool. And I'm sure you're in the same boat. Yeah. And then I think in their training season, their, their spike week really like opened my eyes in a whole new way to what I'm physically capable of, even when my mind is like trying to tell me that I'm done. And, uh, that I think I'll carry with me forever. Cause it totally changed what I, what I know I can do, which is pretty empowering. Oh yeah. So what was your inspiration behind like getting so passionate about wildland fire and prescribed fire in particular, like the, the preventative side of things? Cause that's what you're pretty much focused on nowadays. And I think I, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah, that's, that's really how I got into all of this. So, um, definitely like fire was a big deal to me as a kid, uh, growing up in Temecula during some of the like biggest Southern California fire years. I, I saw a lot of pretty wild fire behavior just as in my childhood. And when I transferred to UC Berkeley, um, I, I got involved in the like environmental science classes. They have a really great fire ecology class at UC Berkeley taught by Scott Stevens and or Dr. Scott Stevens. And he uh, really impressed upon me that we have so much great science on how much we need good fire on the ground in California. And we don't have enough people implementing that. And we're, we're not like the actual activities on the ground are not matching the science that we have saying we need it and how we need it. And then I took this one great class. Uh, it was like a California trees identification class that we traveled all over California to get outside and learn about ecosystems and trees. And, uh, on one of those weekends, we went up to the Klamath and I met Dr. Frank Lake up there, who's a, an indigenous leader and works for the forest service, um, as an ologist and, and I got to sit with him around a campfire that weekend. And he was telling me about like just how badly we need more prescribed fire on the ground and how we need to overcome the hurdles, keeping us from doing it. And so between those, like I knew that the education piece was important if I was going to make an impact, but they really like those two kind of lines of education telling me the implementation was where the gap was, uh, really drove me to wanting to focus on that and, and figuring out how I could contribute my career to getting more implementation on the ground. And then in, uh, 2011 or 2012, I had the opportunity to go to Alaska and burn with the nature cons or not Alaska, sorry, ne Nebraska, <laughs> similar sounding words. Um, I got the opportunity to go to Nebraska and burn with the nature conservancy in tall grass prairie. And it was, uh, incredible. I had done one prescribed burn before then and, uh, got out there and we're burning 1200 acre tall grass prairie units with like Buffalo in the background and groundhogs and like like scenic. all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and I had this, uh, awesome, female mentor who took me under her wing for that two week assignment, um, and taught me all of the basics on the fire line, Emily Homan. And, uh, it was just such a cool experience getting to be out there. I like swam in the Niobrara river, uh, at the end of each day, it was really cool. So 
uh, I think that really like sparked me on the like implementation side before that I knew that that's what I wanted to try to do to make a difference. But then I got that experience and was like, Oh, this is amazing. Uh, this is, definitely this want is the to do this. Right here. This is the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, that was the first time I ever learned about what a burn boss was and, you know, it was like all starry eyed and young and new to it. And I was like, Oh, someday I want to be the burn boss so I can get more fire on the ground. Um, so yeah, started a whole path of like researching what it would take to get there and working on it. Nice. And that kind of led into your doctorate program or. Yeah. So the doctorate program was interesting. I I had no plans. I've never been like a very academic type person. Um, I did community college and then transferred to UC Berkeley. Um, and like really just did that because I got in (laughs) and I had a full ride scholarship. So I was like, Oh, I got to do this. And then right before I graduated, uh, undergrad, I was, I was basically, I'd been working in the lab in addition to working in restaurants, uh, in the Scott Stevens lab, uh, just, you know, trying to engage myself in fire. And, um, I was told that if I wanted to like pursue it, I could probably do the PhD in the Scott Stevens lab and it could probably do it funded for through research. And, um, it was another one of those moments where I was like, well, I can't say no to that. <laughs> uh, and like golden even though I don't right feel there. like an academic person, I I've got to at least try. And I've been doing research in the lab that it seemed like I could transfer some of that research toward the PhD and kind of have that leg up. So, um, so yeah, then I, I decided to do the PhD the whole time. I was like, excited to be getting through that challenge. And it was so hard. <laughs> the PhD was so hard. And like, it took a lot of a different type of uh, skill building around like the self-motivation to figure out how to learn how to code without taking classes in it and like how to do statistical analyses when that wasn't something I had known really how to do before. Um, and the whole time I kept like asking Scott Stevens, Dr. Scott Stevens, if I could like spend the summer out on the hotshot crew instead. And and he's like, no, you got to focus on your research. (laughs) Just get through this PhD. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get through it. Um, so just, yeah, hunkered down and did that while like going out on prescribed fire assignments, uh, intermittently throughout. And then as soon as I graduated, I was like, I really need to get out on a crew. (laughs) Still got the fire bug. Yeah. (laughs) Forever. So the fire ecology thing, like that was like one of your major passions. Right. And I just want to kind of pick your brain about like, and get some insight about how important prescribed fire is in, in I mean, we're kind of exclusive to the state of California, but a lot up and down, up and down the lot along the West coast. I mean, it's a pretty fire adapted ecosystem relatively. I mean, fire is not the solution for every landscape. We know that, right. I'm not saying it's a silver bullet or magic wand or anything like that, but we definitely need to put more fire on the ground. And I think that a lot of people are lost on this because when they see smoke, general public thinks, oh, it's an emergency, right? However, you and I know being operational at one point in our lives, while well, you're still operational, I'm not, that we know that even if in this suppression context, like putting fire on the ground to stop the main fire is one of the safest, most effective and ecologically beneficial ways to stop a fire. So why aren't we applying that in a preventative context more so what are your thoughts on that yeah oh my gosh so much there it's it's pretty exciting so uh yeah i mean i think we just have to acknowledge the many millennia that indigenous peoples have been stewarding this landscape with fire like when colonizers first came to California, they're like, wow, this place is so beautiful. It almost looks like a tended garden. And it's because it's true. It was was being tended very actively. Um, And so California and the West Coast and really a lot of the U.S. and a lot of uh, a lot of the world where people have been for a really long time is really adapted to fire, particularly Mediterranean environments, though, for sure. Um, And yeah. So like where, where I work in the North Bay area, um, we, we have oak woodlands, redwoods and coastal prairies that are kind of the three ecosystems that I really focus my mind on that are like frequent fire adapted. So we have chaparral too, which is adapted to infrequent fire and more intense fire behavior. Um, but in terms of that, like 
frequent fire that requires people to apply it because it doesn't happen by nature, (laughs) um, that those three ecosystems really need it. And then across the West Coast and more generally, um, and you get into like forest service held lands, you get those mixed conifer forests. um, And those are those are really also very adapted to mixed severity to low severity fire with small patches of that higher severity, if any. Um, and, and like you were saying, like, oh my gosh, the, the fire assignments that I got to be on with Redding, uh, and this is why I love going back out with them. Uh, they so often end up on fire assignments where they're doing huge indirect firing operations and they're so beautiful and so effective. And it's like a dream come true for someone who does prescribed burning and wants to see prescribed burning reach, uh, like a scale that would actually be beautifully effective for the way we live with fire um, to like go out with a crew and in, in the middle of a wildfire event, get to like do some really beautiful burning operations and have all of these resources available to us to burn thousands of acres really well is a pretty remarkable thing, especially when it's being done in the middle of a uh, wildfire season and in the middle of a wildfire event. Oh yeah. Um, the most austere fire conditions that you can imagine and people are successful yeah. about it. Yeah. And like not, not even nuke the forest, but just have beautiful fire effects, even in those conditions. And if we can do that under this emergency scenario, we should absolutely be able to do that outside of an emergency scenario. It's just about how we're investing our resources. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's like, what do you want to do? It's like, do you want to try and get ahead of the curve and prevent a stand replacing fire in a place that's not at its interval for a stand replacing fire? Or yeah. do you want to just like, ah, shit, strip and rip. Looks like we uh, lost X amount of thousand acres. It's- yeah. And yeah, those acres are really meaningful to people, right? Like oh, yeah. our forests provide so much habitat and recreational value and they, they give us really beautiful uh, water that we can use. So like we're, we're so connected to the landscape, even if we think of ourselves as separate. Um, and so it's just, yeah, you, you can't, overstate the importance of of stewarding these landscapes in a way that they provide all of those resources that we so very much love about them um, and we get all that benefit and can can live in harmony with the land around us oh yeah i think as a as a as a human culture i think we need to re uh frame our relationship with fire because like looking into it and how deep indigenous burning goes it's it's crucial and it's critically important for the health of ecosystems around the world, because if you look into it, there is not a single continent besides Antarctica on the planet where indigenous cultures haven't burned previously. There's not a single continent. So. Yeah. If <laughs> these indigenous cultures were onto this, I mean, if you go through and like that's what one thing I'm a big game hunter, I'm a fly fisherman. Like that's one thing it like attracts game like the next season these burn scars on the edges of the bird scars where this fresh forbs are all this, all this food, this rich, nutritious food for these animals are, that's where you go hunt. However, there's a difference between, you know, catastrophic wildfire and beneficial wildfire, like ecologically beneficial wildfire. And I think that, uh, indigenous cultures, they, they were onto it and we've to some degree lost that, but I think it's making a comeback. Yeah. I mean, so those indigenous cultures are still around and, and here and, and many of those elders are still um, practicing and, and passing on that knowledge to, to their, um, yeah, to the, the next generations. Um, and so we have all of that many thousands of years of indigenous scientific knowledge. It is science and process um, that, that they've spent thousands of years developing. Oh, and yeah. then we a have a lot longer than we've been around. <laughs> yeah, held a lot longer. Um, so, so much knowledge there. And then we, we also have in combination with that kind of the Western science that gives us some, some other verbal frameworks for how we communicate about these things. So we have, you know, the natural fire return interval and fire regime. So we have frameworks from Western science around how we talk about the ways, the specific ways in which individual ecosystems are adapted to fire. Um, and that we can kind of combine those in a lot of ways. And, and we have so much robust knowledge about what types of fire each of these ecosystems need and on what frequency. Uh, so 
you can almost like really start creating friendships with each of these landscapes, knowing what those friends are are looking for and needing from us to steward them. Um, and then in addition to that, we have knowledge about like the way people live now and the way uh, life is going to probably look in the future. And we can put all of that knowledge together to really have a robust understanding of what's needed if we want to live uh, in a in a harmonious and positive way with the world around us. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing too, is like, I mean, look at the scale and scope of this land management, right? Like if I, I guess you want to call it land management, you can call it stewardship, you can call it whatever you are, would you ever you want really. But if you look at the landscapes in basically in Canada, North American continent, I mean, all around the world, I mean, th- all of these things, they need to be managed. And specifically, we have a problem here in the U S with the 10 AM policy where a bunch of foresters from the East coast decided to write a prescription saying you will suppress every fire for <laughs> by 10 AM the next day. Right. Well, that's built up a bunch of fire debt, if you will. Yeah. So this fire debt, I mean, we've turned off nature's garbage disposal. I mean, some of these lighting fires, like why, why are we putting them out? Like what's going on here? And now we're in this situation where we have these catastrophic mega fires and it's no surprise to me. It's no surprise to you. But how do we get into the position to where we can scale this up and even democratize the use of fire in the appropriate context? Obviously, there's going to be suppression times, you know, middle of August when it's, you know, an east wind event and it's 100 F my life out. We're going to have to put a fire out. I don't think suppression is ever going to go away. But if we can fight fire on our terms with more prescribed fire, we're going to be managing a lot more effective uh, stewardship to the land. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's that combination that we're really seeing when we look at the bigger picture now that we are, we're going to need to be managing rather than suppressing as much as we can of the wildfires that we have. So looking at the perimeters and looking at, okay, over here, we've got communities and houses. So yes, we're going to have to suppress this side, but over here it's moving into wilderness or it's, it's not directly impacting uh, human populations. And so we're going to encourage this side to continue moving and, and, you know, use pre pre designated locations where we will contain it. Um, and, and the more we can, or the more, uh, effectively and efficiently we can shift toward that, uh, approach, the better off we're all going to be. And then, uh, in addition to that piece of the way that we manage wildfires is going to be, it just like you said, democratizing the use of fire as well and and empowering people to work within communities to get good fire on the ground and steward steward the lands that they're responsible for. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean it's like it's like that question that we always hear. I'm gonna say it again, even though I said it earlier when we were weren't recording, but it's like how do you burn a million acres? Yeah. Well you train a million people to burn an acre. <laughs> it's pretty easy. That's the, the democratization yeah. of fire. But bringing it back to you, what you're uh, saying earlier about um, letting some of these fires n- not necessarily go, but do their thing in a, a resource of benefit. Right. When we're yeah. doing these fires, when like the Stanislaus National Forest. Right. They had a really good case study this year where there was a lightning fire within a prescribed fire unit. It was pre-treated. And it just punked around, cleaned up the forest, and it was a huge success. And I think they got like, I want to say 1,500 acres of nice. beneficial fire uh, use or fire yeah. monitoring, multiple management objectives, whatever the term is now. But I think we should, like you said, we should be doing more of that because every yeah. fire we said, who was it that said, was it you that said for every fire that we, every acre of fire that we suppress that we are possibly getting another five to 10 acres of catastrophic wildfire? Do you remember? Ooh, I didn't that? say that, but I believe it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who said that, but it makes sense to me. And yeah, I, I do think we're making progress on this. I, I went out on a FOBS assignment, field observer assignment, um, on the Six Rivers Lightning Complex this past summer. And and that the story from that should really be just like sung from the mountaintops because it was a beautiful, kind of like the Stanislaus one you just referenced, like 
uh, really reasonable weather conditions. It was a whole bunch of lightning strikes in really pretty strategic and valuable locations, started many small fires uh, that weren't negatively impacting folks. And, and the teams that managed that work with the local communities. Uh, and I think Will Harling was involved in this and they they were doing indirect ignitions for more acres, I think, I think it ended up being about 50,000 acres of, of good fire on the ground from that lightning complex because they decided to only suppress where it was going up against houses. Mm -hmm. And other than that, they encouraged it to burn in beautiful places and ways. The perfect so, mosaic pattern, low intensity. Beautiful. Burn. Yeah. And just because of the way our structures are set up or like not our homes, but the kind of infrastructure around fire management uh, that's work that would not have been able to be done in their current setup in any other way. They needed that lightning uh, wildfire context in order to be able to get that good work done. Um, and I think until we can flip the way we're managing this whole system, that's going to be the best way that we have to reach significant uh, improvements. Oh yeah. And that's another thing too. It's kind of a double-edged sword though, because you have some of these areas, especially on the Eastern Sierras, uh, or sorry, Western Sierras, uh, Eastern too. I mean, these, some of these forests haven't seen fire in so long that they're just completely overstocked. They're diseased. It's like the population concentration versus the virulence of a disease, right? Yeah. It's the higher yeah. population density, the faster something's going to spread, something detrimental is going to spread. Right. But yeah how do you get in there and treat, how do you pre-treat all these acres to prep it for burning? And you need boots on the ground. You need tech, you need fire use, you need natural fire starts. You need all of it. There's no silver bullet for it. Yeah, absolutely. You, you definitely need all of it. And, and you need to be making use of every opportunity you have when you have the right weather conditions and you can get the resources or the people and equipment in place, you, you need to be taking advantage of that. Even these really overstocked areas that are in poor health right now um, can be dealt with or at least significantly improved by fire as a first century treatment if it's lit in the right way and in the right weather conditions and, and fuel conditions. So it's, it's a narrower burn window, I would say, <laughs> because, oh, yeah. um, of course, if it's way overstocked and there's way too much fuel on the ground, um, you're going to have a higher likelihood of it burning too hot during a lot of those burn windows. But, but there are definitely burn windows where you can get that more mosaic pattern, even if it's overstocked in the first place. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. doing it at the right time, right treatment, right place, right time, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Weather. It's a, but while you're waiting yeah. for that burn window, you shouldn't just be waiting for the burn window. You can be getting all of those resources working and, and getting those different treatments on the ground in the meantime. It's just going to take that all hands, all hands approach. Let's get everyone working on this together. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Forest Service, I, was, I think that they're trying to do some pretty ambitious targets with fuels, uh, especially with like the implementation of the uh, designated landscapes project. Yeah. I mean, that's 16 million acres in some of the most fire prone areas across the West. Yeah. That's ambitious. And they have yeah. 10 years to do 16 million acres. Yeah. It's exciting. It it's is. ambitious, but it's good. <laughs> it's what we need. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing too, is like, there's a lot of administrative barriers to, you know, promoting the use of good fire. I mean, we have NEPA, we have community involvement, we have uh, basically politics, you know, it's like, well, what are we going to do here about the population of Tahoe doing a massive prescribed fire in that burn window when everybody wants to go and ski, you know, right. do that springtime skiing. It's granted yeah. that's, this is arbitrary, but how do but you it's, message it's real. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for, uh, prehistorically. So before colonizers got to California, um, I think the, the low end of the estimate these days is agreed to be around four and a half million acres a year of, of fire that's on the ground in California. End. What was that? That's low end in California alone. That, that's, that's like Scott Stevens published an, a paper that came to that number. I think it might've been in, uh, it might've, that might've been in 2007 that that came out maybe a little bit after that, but, um, 
there have been other papers since then as well that estimate the, the number to be even higher. So, so conservatively four and a half million acres a year. And I think the only year we hit that in the last couple of decades was maybe 2020 was the really high, um, acreage year. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the way in which those acres are burning is massively different because like you said, the overstocking thing, we're getting way more, uh, like high severity, large patches now, but the four and a half million acres a year before colonizers got here meant that the skies were smoky most of the summer. Mm -hmm. And, and that's something that, uh, kind of artificially people nowadays haven't really been living with. We, we live with blue skies most of the year. And then we have these events where it's crazy smoky and smokier probably than it would have been prehistorically on most days. Um, but if we're really going to see a change in this, it's it's going to be a, a huge public messaging um, and public buy in hurdle that we're going to have to cross because it's it's going to be a lot more consistent smoke. We can burn under windows where the smoke lifts better and moves in a direction that we feel good about. That doesn't impact people or expose people as much as those wildfire events right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but the smoke output is going to be a thing. Yeah, we'll, We will be putting up smoke more frequently across the year, just hopefully with better outcomes in the way that that smoke lifts and moves and the wildfires that people are getting now. You know, one thing I do want to look into is like uh, the East, specifically Florida, Carolinas, all those areas where they're just burning like crazy every year. Like it's no problem for them to light off, you know, 2000, 2,500, 5,000 acres in a day. And people are cool with it. Like how do, how do we implement that public perception over here on the West coast? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think part of it is there, it it never went away. They've been burning consistently uh, for many, many generations. And so it's just the norm. Mm -hmm. Whereas we, we did a really good job of, uh, yeah, uh, completely eliminating that here for quite a long time and uh, to everyone's detriment. Oh, yeah. I mean, now we have uh, huge swaths of land. Like uh, one of the places that I usually go to is Hat Creek. I usually do like a boys trip. We go fly fishing and stuff like that. But coming up through uh, above Susanville, California, where the hog fire scar is, I think that was, I want to say it was like 2019 or 2020. I forget what it was. But to this day, that place is a deadscape. It is completely sterilized because that forest was overstocked. I mean, they were doing some thinning logging and all that stuff, but it wasn't at the scale that was needed to prevent some sort of catastrophic wildfire like the hog fire. And to this day, it is a deadscape. It burns so intense uh, on that plateau above uh, Susanville that there's nothing growing, no invasives in the forest. The only thing that's growing is in the, what I'm assuming to be imported soil. That's the road base. That's the only thing that's growing is like invasive species that have been carried by tires and mud and trucks and all that stuff. Otherwise it's uh, dead. Yep. Yeah. It's awful. It's, and it's, it's just, it's not setting us up for a good future. You know, there's a, a lot of, I hear people use the narrative of like, Oh, you know, once a wildfire is burned through, it's like that reset button. So then you can do a lot of good stewardship from there. And it's like, actually in a lot of these places that that wildfire is not acting as a reset button. It is acting as a, like <laughs> a nuclear bomb oh, yeah. <laughs> that is then way harder to, to restore and come back to a place where there's resilience and ecosystem value, um, in that location. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly battling with that narrative because there, there are places where it is the case. Yes. It's a reset button and now you can maintain it rather than having that like over, um, or having that really difficult entry for century to treat. But in a lot of these places, it's the opposite of a reset button. If you, if you miss that window before the wildfire comes, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's burnt so intensely there. It's killed like the mycelium layer, the microbiome yeah. in the soil. It's just nuked everything. And now everything's just yeah. standing dead trees, a bunch of snags. It's a snag patch. So yeah. I think preventing yep. that is going to be the key to the future, especially if we're going towards a, you know, statistical data, data going, you know, well, frequently spiking in intensity and sky size of wildfires. Yeah. Well, I mean, why don't we try and change the environment and get ahead of the curve? 
Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, making use of those opportunities where we can get that mosaic pattern with fire on the ground, um, whether that is uh, a wildfire that's burning under conditions where it's not uh, really completely nuking out massive thousands of acres of areas. Um, and then, and then doing those prescribed burns when we're not getting those natural ignitions that we can then steward, um, under good conditions and, 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 and other tools. It's, it's both of those things and more (laughs) so much. Well, here's the thing too, is an ugly truth about fire ecology that I've been, you know, I'm not, I'm not a pro, I'm not a doctorate like you, but (laughs) however, I mean, there is also a necessity for stand replacing fire behavior, but it's very infrequent, right? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So stand replacing fire, um, to me really, well, yeah. So it's in, in most ecosystems that would be appropriate in very small patches. Um, and then you get, other ecosystems that are are really adapted to that stand replacing fire. That's what they want and need. So, um, like knob cone pine grows around here and that's adapted to stand replacing fire. I know lodgepole pine and bishop pine. Um, and then a lot of chaparral also you're, you're looking for that high, high severity, high intensity fire. Um, yeah. So, so those are all stand replacing fire regime areas. And, and I think the main thing, for public education there is like, don't build your house up against chaparral or knob cone pine or bishop pine. Like they're going to burn at some point when they burn, they will probably burn with high severity fire and that's what they need and stand replacing fire. And, and you just don't want your house by it. <laughs> just no. go live in, in a place where that's not the way fire is adapted to move. And then in our, in our other areas, we like high severity fire is a part of ecosystems, but it's just generally in those other ecosystems, it's a, that's an adaptation for very small pockets of that fire so that we're creating little patches of openings. It's part of that mosaic structure and pattern. Gotcha. Yeah. I think that's a lot of, uh, a lot of people are kind of confused on what stand replacing fire actually is. Uh, especially yeah. the public, they just don't understand fire. So I think it's like, I think it's very important that organizations like yours, like uh, the fire forward. I mean, that's a huge, has a huge education component to it. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> to, to back up, I'm, I'm the director of a program called fire forward that is operating within the nature conservation organization in Audubon Canyon ranch. Um, and Audubon Canyon ranch has been around since 1962 uh, and, and started just protecting a piece of land from development along the Bolinas, uh, Stinson beach area of coastline, and then, uh, ended up acquiring other properties across Marin and Sonoma counties. And, I joined Audubon Canyon Ranch in 2015. Um, I was still finishing my PhD and I uh, was hired with the express purpose of uh, they were trying to get prescribed fire on the ground on their own preserves and uh, were having a really hard time of it. So they hired me specifically with the intent of having me plan a prescribed burn on one of their preserves in the Sonoma Valley. And I was starry eyed (laughs) and I was like, I can do this. I've been burning for a while now and, uh, I know what it takes to do it. So I'm going to, and I think I can make this happen. So I I took the job and, uh, that was like October, 2015 and immediately started trying to get a prescribed burn planned. And in May of 2017, we finally got a burn on the ground. And for anyone who works in fire, Like this is going to sound insane, but we were trying to do 21 acres of grass burning with like dirt, 21 acres with dirt road all around it in the Sonoma Valley. Perfect box. It's like your control lines are already put in. (laughs) Yeah. Control lines are already put in. uh, And, you know, they're like, there are some oaks in the grass units and the oaks have green grass still underneath them. So it's like very shaded field break almost. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so uh, we ended up with, this is after like a, yeah, a year and a half of planning a little bit more. Uh, we ended up with 75 firefighters on scene, uh, 13 engines, two dozers and a helicopter on standby to burn 21 acres of, of grass that has dirt road surrounding it. Uh, <laughs> a little heavy handed, so, don't you think? <laughs> it was a really heavy handed, really heavy handed. And, uh, 
and we had brought in uh, Ben Jacobs, who's this uh, type one burn boss from National Park Service to be the burn boss. And uh, and he got uh, removed from the burn boss position by local and state firefighters and was turned into basically just like a not even a firing boss, but like he helped run ignitions. <laughs> um, so there was like just so much misunderstanding and lack of trust and no infrastructure for this to happen. Um, and so I talked with the, the then, uh, director of Ottawa Canyon ranch and we talked about like, this is a much bigger need. This isn't just about getting a prescribed burn done on one of our preserves. This is about creating capacity for doing prescribed burning as stewardship work because these landscapes need it. Um, and it's almost impossible to get it done on private lands right now. Um, we don't have all of that training and, and knowledge and background that the feds have that, that allows even the possibility of prescribed burning, whether or not they're getting acres, the, the number of acres done that's needed is another question. Um, that's a huge question. So, <laughs> what is we, the target there? <laughs> yeah, we we uh, decided to set out on launching Fire Forward, and that was with the intent of it being a, a more broad prescribed fire capacity building program. And Fire Forward has really been uh, dedicated to an approach of like seeing what the hurdles are and then trying to knock down those hurdles and progressively as we knock down one hurdle there's always another one so we keep identifying what those are and trying to model what could be done better um, and how we might be able to continue making progress and change so we started off by building an equipment and gear cache because uh, de relying on the local fire departments was not going to be a solution because they need all of that gear and equipment in case they get a call. Totally mm -hmm. reasonable. Understandable. Um, yeah. So we built up all the gear and equipment cash. And then uh, we realized, you know, we're burning in the Sonoma Valley. So I'm like very uh, well, call it what it is. Bougie. <laughs> bougie. Yeah. Bougie area. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of very fancy homes and vineyards and, uh, you know, raceways and, uh, telephone or whatever power poles, all of that. So, um, every burn almost kind of leans toward a type one burn in some way. Just and based it's on only really alone. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just through mitigations that we can bring things down to lower complexity. And so we do a lot of mitigation, but, um, yeah. So we started training volunteers through the federal qualification system. So, uh, started offering just basic S-130, S-190 for basic wild and firefighter trainings. And then, uh, built up, we, we teach S-212, the chainsaw class and, uh, you know, teach pumps and water use and, uh, now teach some leadership classes. So L280 and all of that, uh, S131. And at this point we've trained up around 400 people in this community who, who have dedicated years now of volunteering their time on prescribed burns and taking these classes so that they have all of that formal skills and training that they need to do this work well. And, uh, we've done thousands of acres of burning now and about like 320 or so of those 400 ish people that we've trained come out to our burns on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. Um, and then from there we developed all of these other programs because we kept seeing other hurdles. So, um, we developed a fellowship program, which is for folks who work in ecology and land management for other agencies and organizations and their agencies or organizations send them to us for about 300, 300 hours of a year to get those courses and more hands-on training on how to plan and implement a prescribed burn. So, um, we're basically trying to train them up in the uh, through the capacity of the California State Certified Burn Boss curriculum, which is a way lower bar than RXB2, but California supports it and uh, and likes that as a way of getting more people officially certified to implement burns. And with that comes some backing from the state around protections. Uh, regarding liability uh, and like claims fund access and all of that. So we have that fellowship program and then we launched an apprenticeship program. So that's a uh, five full-time 11 month term position folks that work on our team 
as a prescribed fire practitioner squad or oh, yeah. apprentice squad. And they're, they're brand new when they come in, they usually have like S130, S190, and that's about it. And then maybe they've been on like one or two burns, so they know they love it, but they haven't really had access otherwise. And we're paying them for 11 months to just like do the work and learn as much as they possibly can. And that's not just learning about firefighting or fire implementation, but it's also learning about ecology and uh, doing botanical surveys and how to do monitoring and how to like uh, make sure they're doing this work in a way that is genuinely stewardship. So prescribed fire as stewardship. Um, and, and that's been really effective and incredibly fun, like <laughs> awesome folks coming into that program and they're getting uh, pretty cool jobs after that. And that was exciting, but we saw that there's still a challenge in like, if you hire someone for one year and give them all these skills and California is still building the infrastructure for what this workforce looks like, we need to then like also have career track positions for people to stick around. So we now, as of like this month and next month, we're standing up a 12 person prescribed fire module nice. that works full time year round. Um, and I'm just, I'm so pumped. So that's going to be two squads, the apprentice squad and the practitioner squad, which is folks with more experience who are still at that, maybe like that firefighter two level, but they, they like operate smoothly and they've been doing it for a while. They're dialed. Um, and then we've got two squad leaders and a crew module lead. Um, and uh, I'm so excited for them to start because that's that's where we start seeing a demonstration of like true career pathways for people who are coming in from entry level to like they have more experience to they're they're leading at some level or leading at a higher level. And then people can move into planning positions over time or leading programs. And if we can model what that infrastructure would look like to really dedicate resources and time and energy to the prescribed fire career track, I think we could start seeing real change at, at pace and scale that we want. Oh yeah. That's the thing. You're democratizing fire. How do you burn a million acres? Well, you're doing it <laughs> starting to at least. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And we still have that volunteer base, that 400 people that we train that come out on burns, but we're also creating paid positions. So for folks who can't volunteer their weekends or volunteer their vacation days to come out on burns, we have ways for people to actually do this in a paid and equitable way. Um, so there are multiple ways for people to engage um, at different points in their career or in their life. And uh, and now across multiple NGOs in Northern California, we're, we're setting up kind of an all hands, all lands agreement where we can share those resources across the nonprofits and across even from nonprofits to federal land. Oh, wow. And, uh, if we can really build that out, uh, that's really starting to demonstrate infrastructure because it's similar to wildfire, right? Like there's a wildfire here. We're sending firefighters from all over the place to support it. Um, and in this case, we're saying, okay, during the different prescribed fire windows that we have in Northern California, we're sending fire or fire practitioners across Northern California to support those burns and make sure they can happen. Oh yeah. Well, look at the add on benefit just to the, uh, just eat, like look at the meteoric rise in PBAs, uh, yeah. prescribed fire or prescribed burn associations in California. I mean, some of these folks that come through and train at your property on Audubon Canyon ranch, I mean, they can go on to these PBAs and continue their education and uh, yeah. <clears throat> I just also want to say you're on a track right here to really amplify the workforce because, I mean, you and I were over at the Red Sky uh, Summit in, what was that, Oakland, Alameda? Yeah. Yeah, you know, recently, Alameda. <laughs> Alameda. And uh, I really appreciate what you said during one of your discussions because what it boils down to is at the end of the day, this is not glorious, sexy work. It's very hands-on. It's very tactile. It's dirty and it requires boots on the ground. If we don't have those boots on the ground, then all of this tech, all of this fancy stuff, our suppression budget's going to costs are going to go up. Like we need boots on the ground or else all this stuff is pretty much worthless. So just want to give you a shout out there. That was pretty <laughs> impressive what you said in front of all those people. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, it's, I think it's key because not only does this work take people on the ground, but it, it is, it's human work. Like it, it, that connection to the landscape and, and 
helping people understand where they fit in the world around them and, and the, as, give them a sense of place. Um, through all of that, we're, we're doing education also in a, in a bigger picture around the way we want to live with fire. Mm -hmm. And the more people we can engage in that conversation, um, and in a very, a visceral hands-on way, the more effective we're going to be at creating change in the way we live with fire. So um, that's part of it. It's like, not only do you like reach a million acres by teaching a million acres to burn or a million people to burn, but you, you then have a million people who are constituents of a culture of, of, and like believe in the need for that million acres to burn and all of the people that they know who they then influence toward that. Right. So if we exclude people from the solution, we're never going to be able to actually implement the solution. Um, even if we have the tech to do it <laughs> because the, the public's not going to be bought in. But if we, if we include people in their own agency to, uh, to make a positive difference and to, engage in the world around them and to steward these landscapes and connect to, to nature and community at the same time, we can actually see culture change in addition to getting the work done. Which oh, is absolutely. Key. I mean, it's the original viral marketing context, right? I mean, it's like, yeah, if people are, if people are going to like word of mouth, tell each other like, Hey, this is an amazing thing. And this is why they're going to probably get, have more of a interest in it to get involved. They're going to get involved and they're going to tell their friends and so on and forth. The amoeba so grows. But at the uh, end of the day, I think that, you know, prescribed fire is an art form and you're like the Bob Ross <laughs> like teaching these people <laughs> how to do this stuff in a very safe manner. And it's, it's cool to see that, that evolution. Cause I've been following you. We've been following each other for what, five years now. So, or so. And, uh, it's, it's really cool to see that, that Bob Ross <laughs> journey I'm using air quotes here for the people that aren't watching this on YouTube, but it, it's cool because prescribed fire is an art form. That's something that I have never really gotten into with my career path. I was always focused on suppression, but if I could go back and do it again, I'd probably split it 50, 50 between fuels and fire management and suppression because yeah. getting ahead of the curve and painting that landscape with a drip torch as your paintbrush. I mean, that's, that's the best way to do it in a lot of areas specific to ecology that's required there, you know, but yeah. <laughs> that is easily the most flattering analogy I've ever received for, <laughs> for what I do. I'm, I'm going to like, hold on to that little nugget forever that I'm at all like Bob Ross. Who's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I like that analogy too. Cause, um, it's not that Bob Ross is like, like a Vincent Van Gogh of art or something, right? Like he's, he's Pretty very pedestrian. I mean, yeah, he's talented, yeah, exactly. but yeah, which is the whole idea here that like anyone can do this. It is an art form. Yeah. It's, it's an art form and it's an accessible art form. Yes. If you just like come out and join the community and, uh, you know, spend a little time watching and learning and participating. Um, it's very intuitive for people. Uh, it's, it's part of, part of what we are is like the human race. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I really love that. Uh, it, it should be that way, right? It should be accessible and like free television or whatever that people can PBS. engage in. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it is, it's, it's crucial because, you know, that not only does that change the narrative and public perception of uh, prescribed fire and fire use and like when it's appropriate to suppress a fire, but also it empowers people. And I think that's a big thing. There is, you know, if you empower that million acre or million people to burn one acre safely, of mm -hmm. course, in the right place, time, all the, all the prescription for that. Right. Then yeah. that has uh, cascading effects across the country. Cause I guarantee you that amoeba is going to spread eventually and bringing it back to the Bob Ross thing. I think that his biggest thing is like, yeah, he might not have been the Van Gogh or insert stellar artist here, but yeah. he was relatable. Yeah. He was like the common person is like, well, shit, if he can do it or, then I can do it. Same thing with you. If, if you can teach these people, if she can do it, you're real, you're it's, it's visceral, it's hands-on, you're no BS. If they realize that they have that connection with you and they realize that you can do it, even though you're very far advanced in your career, you have a lot of relatability, like to empower people to do what you can do. Yeah. So just the way yeah. I kind of see it. I love it. Yeah. And that's, it's totally the way it should be because it is intuitive to people and we just need to empower people with that. 
accessibility and, and help them see that it's, it's not some mystical thing. It like there's art in it and there's science in it. But if you just like pay attention and dedicate a little bit of your, your like time and energy resources to it, you can, you can do it too. And, and, uh, yeah, we learn very intuitively on the landscape when we're doing that work. Um, and that's, you know, we really do borrow a lot from um, all of that federal suppression, <laughs> paramilitary infrastructure that goes into suppression. But we we kind of like uh, pivot it toward community building. So, uh, you know, we, we use the chain of command, but for us, it's kind of that... Um, chain of accountability. <laughs> so we're like making sure we're keeping accountability for our people and know where people are at. So everyone's staying safe. Um, we're like using trainees and trainers, but that's really so that we can pass on knowledge, uh, to folks who are newer. And then we try to bring out the voices of the folks who are newer so that we get their new perspective on what they're seeing and learning as well. Um, like there's, there's so much value in all of the knowledge that comes from all the different backgrounds that exist um, and kind of blending them together so that people are getting uh, just the most robust experience they can when they're learning these tools. Oh, absolutely. And you know, it's, it's a culture change. So, I mean, the crash course into fire culture, it's not for everybody, but I mean, if you can make it easily digestible to where it's not so hardcore and rigid, but also with it well within the bounds of like op normal operating procedures. I think that even makes it more relatable and more comfortable for the people that are learning how to do this. Yeah. 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 And I'm a, like, I'm a stickler for the way we communicate on the radio. Like I was brought up uh, in this field and mentored by someone who's very communications uh, dialed. And so I've carried that forward into the way I work and teach and uh, so I'm a stickler for the way we use the radio, but it's for a reason. Like there's good reason. Communications is, are just always so important. So, um, like it's not super loosey goosey, no rules, but it's like very clearly understanding and explaining why we do certain things the way we do them and the way in which that creates a safe working and learning environment for everyone, um, and allows us to be really successful in this work and pass on knowledge. Oh, yeah. So what about the continuing mentorship? Um, I know that a lot of your program can, has like a lot of continuing ed and also a lot of mentorship. I mean, you've mentored me. Um, I'm sure you've mentored thousands of other people out there. But how does that mentorship, especially when it comes to like the women in fire, right? I mean, I know a lot of folks will look up to you and look at what you've accomplished. And a lot of people want to be like chasing, not necessarily your coattails, but want to be like you, they're inspired by you. So let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's funny as I like, I don't see myself as like a great leader, mentor, educator, anything like that, but I, I really love community <laughs> and I, uh, if and when I can share something that helps empower someone else, I like to do that. Um, our, our fellowship program uh, has been kind of a, a cool key way that I've seen the opportunities for mentorship in this because um, those are like folks who really showed that they like they like signed a document saying they were dedicating 300 hours in a year to to focusing on this work. And that's really just the start, like 300 hours in one year is just enough to like dip your toes in right oh, yeah. on this art form. So then now we have a, like what, what we're doing right now is a fellowship 2.0. So we did two cohorts of around 15 people, um, who, who learned those basics and dedicated all that time. And now all of those like 30 ish people, are continuing that education with us in a fellowship 2.0. So now they're coordinating some workshops and in exchange, we're continuing to mentor them on like how to write a burn plan, how to do a site visit and see whether a prescribed burn is possible, um, how to do these assessments, how to, how to implement on the ground and be a good leader. Um, and, and it's, it's so cool to see, people change and grow over years. And that's something that I think has become one of the most rewarding parts of my job now. Like seeing people come in initially and being like, Oh God, they like, just they're really struggling. The, the rookie look. Work. It's the rookie look. 
yeah, the Ricky one, yeah. We're like, oh gosh, I, I hope they can get through this hurdle. And then like a couple of years later, I'm like watching them give a briefing at a prescribed burn that they planned and, and they're crushing it, absolutely crushing it. And they're, you know, reaching out to me for little tidbits here and there. But uh, over the course of a couple of years, I see that incredible transformation and it's so inspiring. Um, and so I, I'm constantly growing and learning for myself, like how to, how to continue improving my, my mentorship of others and, uh, and trying to make that as accessible to as diverse an audience as possible. That's, that's been a, a big thing lately is like, how do we make sure we're not cutting people out just like by accident in the way that we set things up from the beginning? Kind of like a blind um, spot and so, something you weren't aware of previously. Yeah. Yeah. Things. Like growing awareness of, of like, does the way that we like set up this Google for it, make it harder for some people to like get involved than others, right? Mm-hmm. Like simple things like that can have so much consequence. So I, I find myself more and more all the time, like trying to zoom out and pay attention to those little things that create um, kind of inequities in the way that people can get involved or not. Um, and, and trying to identify how we can knock down those hurdles and those barriers now too. Um, but yeah, it's, it's funny. I, I just, I never thought that I would be someone who anyone would call like a mentor or a leader. And it's just been like this accidental thing that's come with like my passion for this field and my passion for like sharing it and helping others get access. And I think just now in my career, I'm finally getting to the point where I'm like, I need to put some intention behind how I do this so that I make it uh, like as positive a part of my career as possible for others, which is fun. Which is cool because you have the perfect setup for it. I mean, how many acres are on, uh, do you guys manage over at the uh, Audubon Canyon? Yeah. So uh, we have about 5,000 acres across mostly like three big preserves. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and there's one that we've been just like, doing incredible work at, which is, uh, the Martin Griffin preserve out on the Bolinas kind of Stinson beach area of coastline. And that's 1000 acres. It's got three canyons on it. And then a series of ridge lines between the canyons. And, uh, it's got a bunch of beautiful old coastal prairie that still exists, but almost completely blinked out over the last 40 years. So in the eighties, we had over 200 acres of coastal prairie on that property. And as of, uh, like eight years ago, I think we were down to 16 acres of coastal prairie or maybe even less. Um, so really quickly disappearing just because of the removal of fire and uh, like large herbivore grazing. So it got covered in coyote brush, which is a native species. That's great, but we also really want coastal prairie. So we don't want everything to be coyote brush. And then after the coyote brush came in, we got Douglas firs, uh, encroaching and growing up in there really fast. So, um, it's become an incredible training ground for, for our team, uh, to, to really learn about stewardship in this like long-term intensive way so that we can restore that coastal prairie structure, which coastal prairie is the most diverse grassland habitat in North America. And there's less than 5% of it left. Oh, wow. And that's, largely due to development, but also largely due to fire suppression and removal of large herbivores. So, um, like indigenous peoples for thousands of years are really stewarding these coastal prairies because they're like key grazing areas for that, that attract deer and elk, mm-hmm. um, to them. And, and they have different bird species in their habitat and it's, they're really remarkable areas. Um, But now, especially like with our with our crew and then we have kind of this core team that's been in Fire Forward for, uh, you know, six years now, Uh, we we go out there pretty much year round doing stewardship work. We've got redwoods out there, too. So we do redwood burning in the winter and we're doing um, like you know, burning of coyote brush and Douglas firs that we can bring that coastal prairie back. So year round, we're out there doing really good work and it makes such a nice training ground. We, we love bringing folks out from the community to join us whenever we go out there. Um, and it's, it's, there've been some really cool projects where, where we know we're standing in what used to be coastal prairie, 
Um, we did a crazy hot prescribed burn in 2019 of a really badly Douglas fir encroached area of 10 acres and, you know, just crazy heat on all of those Douglas firs. And we torched a lot of them out in 2019 and uh, it's almost entirely coastal prairie again now, or at least half of the area is robust, beautiful coastal prairie in that t- 10 acres. Nice. And uh, you can now we've been teaching S212 saw classes out there since 2019 too. And you can see the the whole Bolinas Lagoon and out over the Pacific Ocean, you can see the Farallon Islands. And when I started working out there, it was like Blair Witch Project. You couldn't even <laughs> just like, couldn't even get through the foliage. Couldn't get through the through the trees. It was absolutely terrifying. It could be a sunny day and it would be pitch black in the understory Jeez. of the Douglas Firs. It was gross. So yeah, really cool to be able to have access to properties that we can work at for a long time over years and to create access to a place like that for other people who are interested in doing stewardship work um, and reconnect people with land in that way. Um, and then we we burn all over many different ownerships across the region. So uh, we burn on tons of folks, private land and bring the community out to those properties to do that. And then nowadays we also support burning on like regional parks properties and state parks properties uh, and Sonoma Land Trust or like various land trusts and and other agencies and NGOs. Nice. Sounds like you rolled pretty much a nat 20 on the uh, diversity of landscapes and what you're doing over there because you have the diversity of landscape and, you know, some different, subtly different ecosystems to uh, train folks on. And that's critical because if you're just kind of relegated to one space or one ecosystem, like, uh, I don't know, Oak Savannah Prairie, you yeah. know, that's all, you know. So if you yeah. get into the timber, it's going to change. You got to develop yeah. those, 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 uh, slides. So I think it's pretty cool that you have the ability to basically train, educate. You have the ability to put in meaningful stewardship work on a diverse, uh, amount of landscapes. It's pretty cool. It's yeah. pretty unique. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, we were talking before about the complexity of burning out here, given all the infrastructure of like houses, highways, power poles, fences, vineyards. But then there's the complexity of just the actual landscape itself. Like we don't have a probably like we have very few places that even have 30 acres of one contiguous fuel type like it's not <laughs> pretty much anywhere we by any yeah means. it's so non-homogenous the the terrain is so complex and and the habitat or ecosystems that grow on those different terrains is is just as complex as the land itself so um it's like this huge uh yeah benefit to where we're working and also a huge challenge because we are having to very quickly learn or like develop some, you know, artistic and scientific expertise in burning so many different fuel types and, and in different situations like redwood forest from Sonoma to the Marin coast is basically two entirely different fuel types because the redwoods exist and, and grow so differently across those areas. So, um, yeah, it's wildly complex and hugely valuable. And it's still just a drop in the bucket because we go, you know, we go help our nature conservancy partners burn in Idaho or New Mexico or, uh, you know, North Carolina. And it's totally different again. Um, or we go up and help burn the Klamath and it's different again. So um, it's wildly diverse here that we're working, the landscapes that we're working in. And then we're, we're constantly still being exposed to other places that are totally different from anything here. Well, I think another thing that's kind of cool about the diversity and the amount of land that you have is you have the unique ability to try new things. Like you can implement different strategies for uh, shaded fuel breaks. You can implement some tech, uh, you can implement you know, different patterns of burning, you have the ability in this controlled setting to basically have a test bed to see what works the best for ecological benefit too. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's been huge. It's just like a huge part of our program is experimenting. You know, there hasn't been a lot of prescribed burning around this region for like quite a while since colonization. So, um, 
and and there's been so much just changed with the absence of of stewardship. So we're we're constantly experimenting and learning from what we're doing and trying new things and and trying to do things better, um, which is is really fun. And I have such an incredible team, and the community here is so remarkable that we can, uh, you know, really talk about those things openly and learn every time about what we can do better and and keep adjusting and improving, and then hopefully we can share out those lessons learned as we get uh, more finesse around all of this. And I'm stoked because we just finally, I'd say in the last year, got to the point where we have capacity in our team to do the science that we've been wanting to do on the work that we're doing so that we can then share really robust results around what works and what doesn't. Nice. And that's another thing too, is like the whole mentorship and stewardship and the development of these programs, it extends far past uh, just the Audible on Canyon Ranch. I mean, like you said, you're traveling you know, nationally to you know, put fire on the ground in the best places or where it's needed. Not only that, but you're also working with policymakers. You're working with private industry to help develop, like Mystery Ranch, for instance, you're helping develop some of their tools or some of their packs. Uh, you got down the street, you got tech, uh, the tech industry, which is kind of crazy. And I've got my opinions on that. Of course I'm in tech. So fair disclaimer here, <laughs> but, um, you have this ability to like do all of this stuff. I mean, that's pretty unique. Like what inspired you to continue to do that? Especially like with policy, like you're changing some of the game in California. I know you're helping direct yes. that, uh, some of those, those projects and that infrastructure behind, the uh, California burn boss program. Yeah, it's, um, I'd say it's a huge perk and, and what has kept me in the nonprofit space is, is we have that flexibility to, to engage in pretty candid ways in the various aspects of this work, um, that, that we see need an impact, right? That we see are, are needing change. So rather than um, being stuck behind a bunch of red tape, we can we can kind of just be nimble and move and and uh, address the challenges that we're seeing. So that's been huge. Um, yeah, being being so close to the tech space here in the North Bay has been pretty cool for being able to find opportunities for partnership, and and that's been hugely valuable. Um, yeah, I, I think. Uh, 2020 was the first time, uh, Simon came out with an Ignis drone and, and did some like aerial ignitions for us on one of our burns. And, and that was so cool being like, Oh man, this, this opens up so many areas that we thought we would never be able to burn around here. Cause we like, it's too steep and we wouldn't be able to send people reasonably like down into that crazy Canyon, but yeah. maybe we could, if we had that Ignis set up or whatever it is, it opens up ideas and possibilities. Um, and then again, like being in that nonprofit space, uh, myself and my other nonprofit partners, uh, from other NGOs across Northern California and uh, across the U S like we have the flexibility to, to, you know, go to Sacramento and, and be on a cadre and talk about what is needed to affect meaningful change in the state and work together on those problems with policymakers and, um, that has been fulfilling work. It's, it's some of the more, uh, you know, sometimes frustrating work <laughs> for me, but, uh, it's, it's fulfilling because in the room are other people who are, you know, living and breathing this same, um, dream. So I get to go and it's, it's never just me in the room with those policymaker, uh, and policy change opportunities. It's, it's me and a whole bunch of my friends that I've known for the past decade who have dedicated their lives to this and have been mentoring me for many years. Um, so it's, that creates inspiration even in the moments of frustration, which is good. Oh yeah. And it's like, uh, I mean, we keep running into each other at all these events. Like, uh, we ran into each other at, te at, uh, Red Sky uh, the CWI as well, the climate and wildfire yeah. Institute, these annual meetings. And, uh, I think it's cool because both of us were very passionate about like trying to, you know, get ahead of the curve and do what's right for the, uh, the ecosystems and try and get ahead of this problem with catastrophic wildfire. And I, it just goes to prove that even though we are wildly different in background, that we're still coming together for the same common goal. And I think that's imp important because like all these people at Red Sky, all these people at CWI, all these people at, um, you know, anybody who's involved with uh, the wildfire 
uh, either NGO or private industry, we all have a mutual goal. And I think that all of us coming together is very important to share this knowledge and kind of get it out there into the, into the, the world, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's key. I mean, that's, again, that comes back to that community piece and, um, it's going to take everyone working together for us to see and affect change. So, um, I'm, I'm so happy to see that that connectivity is being emphasized more and more across all of us, uh, so that we can actually continue to make progress and be aligned and keep identifying who also is not in the room and how we get them into the room. Um, so that we're, we're not, leaving anyone behind along the way. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, uh, I used to say a lot of the time, like, like networking in the fire industry is very important for like the longevity of your career. Cause you never know where those, those people are going to end up. So I think it's even beyond that though, because what I've come to find out and you've probably, you were actively building this is not necessarily networking because it's like micro, right? You're talking about macro, but the community yeah. building part. Yeah. 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 Like networking has this kind of like uh, D bag kind of context <laughs> or like surface level con yeah. connectivity. Right. You're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're not really connected, but you know, my name, I know your name and someday we might be able to help each other. Whereas that community building piece is like, we know each other and we care about each other's well being, And we're, we're all in this together to, to see what we can do to make a better future as collaborators and as partners. And, uh, you know, even if people are at very different places in their careers or they come from very different backgrounds, everyone has something to contribute. Um, and so it's not a one directional, like I'm networking with you because someday you might be able to help me, but it's that like, we are all bringing something to the table and every person has a, a meaningful voice to bring to the table to help us affect change. And, and as a community and as a whole, uh, all of us together get to a better future, which is, I think just such a cool way to be. And I see it happening all the time and more and more all the time. So we're headed in a good direction, I think. I think so too. And that changing of the narrative behind fire, you know, and like reconnecting our relationship, because let's, let's be honest here. Humanity is inexorably connected with fire. Like we wouldn't have yeah. grown into the species and the, the human race as we are now without the harnessing of fire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And I actually think, um, that connectivity thing, like it's well rooted in the suppression community as well. Like, oh yeah like all those people are your brothers and sisters on the fire line and you're in it together. And, and this is just taking that same concept to kind of a more macro scale of like, like we are all brothers and sisters and, and family and, and everyone has something to contribute and we're going to get there together. Oh, absolutely. And I think that the storytelling process is going to be one of those pivotal things too. And, uh, speaking of storytelling processes, just recently you were, uh, a highlight of mystery ranch, and we did the, they did the fire poppy, uh, short story. That was pretty cool. And yeah, let's talk <laughs> about that a little bit. Cause I watched it uh, a couple of days ago actually and rewatched it actually. But, uh, let's <laughs> talk about that and like how that whole thing came about. Cause that's pretty, it was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, one of our community members here in Sonoma, uh, Sashua Burroughs, I actually call him kind of like my, my fire twin. Cause uh, Sashua and Sasha, obviously very similar names. And then somehow we have the same nickname squish. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> we both have the, the same nickname squish. Um, and yeah, he, he's been burning with us for years now. Um, he lives on a property in rural Sonoma County that we've been doing like redwood burning at in the winter it, like just with community and pretty mellow times of the year. Um, and He's a videographer, professional videographer and photographer. And, uh, yeah, pitch like called me one day and was like, Hey, I think it'd be cool to like pitch to mystery ranch that we do a, a like mini docu-series on you. Um, I was like, sounds cool. Like I love Send all of it. your, yeah, all your photos and videos are so beautiful. Like there'd be no one else I would want to trust with that than you. Like sounds cool. And mystery ranch liked it and supported it. And, mm -hmm. Um, the main thing to me was having the opportunity to capture the community and the work that we do and, and just how rich and beautiful that experience is of doing 
this work in community together. And um, I think you did a, a, a great job of capturing that, I especially like the end of the last video where you, you kind of like flashed through different people's smiling faces. And, you know, those are family to me. So I, every time I get to see their smiling faces on the camera, I get super stoked. Um, and and yeah, I, I hope that if if that video, like if, if a few people watch that and decide they want to come out and, and meet my like family <laughs> and and get the to know this fam. work a little bit try out holding a drip torch, even though they might've not seen themselves as someone who would ever touch a tool or, um, you know, steward land outdoors. Uh, I'll, like that's, that would be amazing to me, but, but even just the capturing of some of that community, uh, really like that made me so happy. <laughs> it was pretty cool. And, uh, I hope that a lot of more, a lot more people see that that way they yeah. can hit you up and we can continue or you can continue to democratize fire use and stewardship. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. It was pretty cool that that happened. I'm, I'm gr so grateful to Mr. Urich for supporting that film being made. It's pretty neat. Good folks. That's for sure. Shout out to Luke. Yeah. yeah major shout out. Which is crazy because it's like, so it, it just goes to show you that community thing back to the community thing. It's like Luke is, uh, the fire program manager of mystery ranch. He's also the president of grassroots wildland firefighters, which back to the workforce development thing. We all show everybody who's listening to this podcast. I hope they know what grassroots is, uh, <laughs> grassroots wildland firefighters, but it just goes to show you that like that community building thing and the interconnectedness of all of the fire practitioners, whether it's on the suppression side or the prescribed fire or vegetation management or stewardship side, we all have that mutual common goal. So it's amazing how small that world is. Yeah, it really is. It's, it's a small world and it, yeah, really well connected. And, and what I hope is that it keeps growing and getting bigger and staying just as connected as it is, which is like, that's, that's where the juice is like finding that, that middle ground of like bringing in as many of the folks as possible, but like keeping that same level of connectivity and closeness. So yeah, it's, that's going to be a fun adventure as we move forward. <laughs> oh yeah. And that's another cool thing too, is like, uh, that community, I don't see hardly like any division. You've, you, have you seen that as well? Have you noticed that? Yeah, it's, it's pretty tight. <laughs> yeah. And I, it's, what's pretty cool is like, it does bring in folks from so many different backgrounds and, and like where you might have never expected people to get along if you just, read about who they are on paper or something, uh, we can all get along really well in that environment. And there's a lot of acceptance across boundaries, which is, um, just, yeah, that gives me a lot of hope for like the future in a bigger, a bigger way where we're living in this world that feels so divisive. And then, uh, yeah, we, we see community kind of transecting that, um, in this space. Oh yeah. So I guess, uh, what do you see as like one of the biggest, like potential issues that we're going to be seeing with this use of fire and the workforce? Like, what are some issues that you see and how do we kind of redirect our attention and our efforts to like get around these or plow through the red tape or whatever to make this more effective and do land stewardship at scale? Yeah, good questions. Um, I, I think the insurance piece is going to continue to be a big challenge and that that's insurance on multiple fronts, right? Like ensuring people to be able to do prescribed burning is a huge challenge right now. Um, and then it's a risky business. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really we need to flip that whole thing on its head and it needs to be that like you have <laughs> like your, you have, your liability, like the liability structure around it. And that, then the the insurance as well needs to be flipped around where like you're liable for not getting this good work done. And, uh, like it's easy to get insurance to do the work because that's like doing the right thing in terms of managing your liability. Um, and it's, it's, then it's just about like making sure you're following some like best management practices relative to the work that you're doing. Um, but right now it's hard to get any insurance at all. 
Yeah. Like operating with safely within the boundaries of what your professional scope is. Right. Yeah. And what your project is. If you're, if you're a private landowner and you're putting a little bit of fire on the ground in the middle of the rainy season in redwoods, you shouldn't need some massive amount of insurance and like the risk there is pretty low and you're operating within your scope of training and, and knowledge and practice. Right. Um, but yeah. So, so the insurance thing needs to be completely flipped, um, and made way more accessible for people who are trying to get this good work done. Um, and then really like setting, like <laughs> the number of dollars you put towards suppression is just incredible. And I would love to see a lot of that going toward managing wildfires. So I, I'm not ever advocating that we spend less on that, but maybe we just shift the way we're using that money on wildfires toward managing where we can and suppressing where we can't manage. Um, but we're also going to need to put a lot of money toward just the, the prescribed fire stewardship piece. And, um, and build the infrastructure so that that really works at scale. Um, I think the nonprofit space is always going to be an important part of it because community is so important in stewardship and, and the like set of skills is somewhat different from just the skills that are involved in suppression. Um, if you're really talking about stewardship and, and tending land and tending community. Um, but I think we're also going to need to see, uh, some like, agency shift as well in like the way Except that we're allocating funds. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, yep. it's always baffled me that there's always an infinity symbol next to suppression costs, like suppression budget. There's literally an infinity sign right next. Yeah. To that. Why are we spending that much money on suppression costs when we could save all that money if we were to try and, you know, use fire or manage the land or do stewardship and try and get ahead of the curve. And yeah, this is a huge scale problem because like we were talking about earlier, there's 640 something million acres of federal lands with a direct fire protection uh, authority from the federal government. That's not inclusive of state, private, county, all the wooey lands, all of that stuff. I mean, it's going to take all hands, all lands, like you're saying, but yeah, we also have to invest in the future as well because what's yeah. the true cost of wildfire catastrophic wildfire? Cause it's not just suppression costs. It's not just the aviation assets dumping retardant on stuff. It's yeah. insurance rates going up. It's the mudslides landslides, the bar bar burned area restoration teams. It's all of that stuff combined. That's the yeah. true cost. But if we yep put a fifth of that infinity symbol into which, st <laughs> which mathematically would still be infinity into <laughs> right. like, you know, prescribed fire and land management. We yeah. could save so much money in the future and it's the pass on benefit and the add on value for Joe public and the taxpayer and the communities that are the most at risk is going to be astronomical in savings. Yeah. Yep, exactly. So, so yeah, I think we're going to need to see some shift there. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's not, you know, uh, there's the whole challenge right now of just like maintaining or reaching needed staffing in suppression. Um, and so, you know, I don't know that, it, you know, on the agency side of all of this, you know, I, I mostly work in the private, uh, space and, and local agency space, but on the federal side of this, like, uh, like what does it take to actually build the workforce to, to do prescribed fire in a meaningful way um, without taxing the same workforce that's already maxed out on suppression um, and, or overtaxing that group. Um, so, so I think there's going to have to be some creativity and, and there's opportunity there in the all hands, all lands work that, like myself and the other NGOs that are focused on this are doing, um, where like we can bring the community, uh, trained folks that we have and the resources and equipment, the personnel and equipment that we have to support burning on federal lands to kind of help fill that gap. And these are folks who are not dedicating their entire summers on suppression assignments and, uh, who, you know, maybe have a lot of heart attachment to the land that, is federally held that needs some stewardship. Um, you know, that can be a lot of people's back doors that they really care about stewarding too. Oh, absolutely. 
but I mean, it's like our priorities have hit. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I'm going to say this for as long as I have breath in my lungs, but I think it's like our priorities on spending uh, on spending. It's like, it's, it's yeah. not in the right areas. Yep. It's, it exactly. feels like, and like yeah. I said, if I can go back and do my career all over again, I mean, for every dollar of prevention, which fuels management burning all that's still prevention yep. at the end of the day, yeah, it's going to save you. I, I can't even imagine how much money that's going to save you in the long run. Yeah. And I do think the, the, federal side of things is working to shift this. I think it's just a very, very big boat to turn around. So it takes, it's going to take time and the NGOs can be more nimble and, mm -hmm. and kind of jump on it in the meantime and maybe do some modeling and demonstration of what that may look like. Um, but it's, it's just going to take a little more time on the federal side, but it's happening. So that's amazing. Slowly, but surely, but bureaucracies don't turn on a dime. So we need everybody. Right. All hands, all hands. We're like, Hey, how yep. do you force your eyes open to watch the, <laughs> the writing on the read the yeah. writing on the wall, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like let's, let's keep moving and getting some good things done and building that community and infrastructure and model, uh, while that boat is like just slowly turning itself. Oh yeah. We can have parallel efforts. It's not rocket science. And like, if we look yeah. to our ancestral past, I mean, they've been doing it for yeah. how many years? It's <laughs> so long since the last ice age in the West coast. So exactly. So yeah. let's get back to our roots and start making a, a meaningful difference. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as you and the future and what that holds, what are we looking at? Where do you want to take fire forward? Where do you want to take Autobahn Canyon ranch? Where do you want to take Sasha Berleman? Where do you want to go? <laughs> What's the future look like? Uh, for you? you know, I, I've, I've never been like, it's weird. I'm, I've never been like ambitious for my career other than like where I see I can serve this need. And so, uh, I think I'm just going to be continuing to watch what the need is and, and trying to fill serving those needs. But for now, I'm so stoked to have that 12 person well or like prescribed fire module standing up, um, and, and be kind of like providing on the ground, this demonstration of what those career tracks look like. And the, the people that are filling these positions are just so cool. I have the most amazing team and community here. Um, so continuing to really just dive in on all of that. And then with that all hands, all lands kind of sharing of resources across regions, um, that's like a whole new level unlocked of uh, being unlocked. able to, yeah, exactly. Like we're like uh, creating that community building of, of sharing culture and resources across these different landscapes and, and NGOs and cultures. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see where all of that goes. And, uh, I think, you know, there's even some conversation about trying to start building out, uh, an equivalent of almost like a P code, like a shared resource pool of funding for these resources to go from, uh, area to area to support each other's prescribed burns year round. And, uh, um, that would be cool it's a dream come true. I mean, like we're seeing meaningful change and we're seeing it being done in this really heart led, bold, beautiful way. And, uh, so I'm, I'm right now, I think I'm like focusing on watching all of that and seeing where we can continue to grow and shift to make that more and more beautiful. Hell yeah. And I think it's a recipe for success because look at how much success you've had so far. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. It's effective. Yeah. I mean, it's effective program. Yeah, it's it's working out, and uh, it's been really fun. <laughs> nice. As for getting involved with Autobahn Canyon Ranch and Fire Forward and the fellowship program, how do we go about contacting you and like trying to get into that program for everybody who's listening? <laughs> uh, well, folks can follow us at Fire Forward on um, Instagram. So it, it might be Fire Forward. I'm actually not sure off the top of my I'll head. Look that up. One of the two. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we have a, a web page as well. So um, fireforward.org is the shortest URL I can say out loud for how to get to our web page. Um, and then, yeah, they can also follow Ottawa and Canyon Ranch. That's the org that we sit within. So if they want like some bigger news as well about what Ottawa and Canyon Ranch is doing. The organization just put out a really beautiful five-year strategic plan in the way that we operate and, and fire is really forward and central to that, which is cool. Um, and then, yeah, uh, 
We work with the local prescribed burn association called the Good Fire Alliance. So folks live in the Marin, Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino area, like anywhere in this general region. Um, and they want to come out and burn with us in community. That's a great way to like find out whenever things are happening. So um, they can join the Good Fire Alliance listserv, which they can find through our website. Um, and then, yeah, if folks have fire experience and backgrounds and want to like bring their uh, their qualifications and skills to prescribe burns and help diversify the backgrounds and that this community has access to, um, we love getting folks who have fire backgrounds to out on our prescribed burns and integrated with the community. So they should just like email me or reach out to me directly. They can follow me at, at like the fire poppy on Instagram and, and reach out to me on the direct message or something. Sweet deal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope everybody is that's listening to this. Got some pretty good tasty tidbits on how to, you know, perpetuate actual stewardship because we desperately need it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, if you're interested, definitely hit up uh, Sasha here and for the fire forward or the fellowship or Audubon Canyon ranch. Cause you're probably going to be growing. Let's be honest here, especially if everything yeah. goes the way that you, well, the way it's been going really, yeah, uh, it's only going to expand that program. So, yeah, I think so. So, so yeah, people should, <laughs> should follow us if they're interested. We get a lot of folks who are like, have done suppression and they're like, eh, I'm like ready to settle down and be around more, but I don't want to lose everything that I've done in fire and um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. We love having that in the community. So yeah. And we'll continue growing. We've grown really fast. So I'm hoping we like chill for a minute this year, but then I'm sure we'll keep growing. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, well, I mean, kind of comes with the territory, I guess, if it's effective, it's going to keep growing. So yep. <laughs> it's how it goes. Buckle up, Sasha. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, cool. Well, yeah. Coming to the end of the show, I uh, always give you the opportunity for you to give some shout outs to some homies, heroes, mentors. Who do you got for us? Awesome. Yeah. I'll just say um, Emily Homan again, that was like the first real like mentor on the fire line that I had. And she was amazing. Made me feel so included and welcome. Jeremy Bailey from the Nature Conservancy has really mentored me from day one all the way through um, in my prescribed fire community building <laughs> endeavors. Um, and then Dan Malia, uh, the superintendent of the Reading Interagency Hotshot Crew is a great mentor. Um, Frank Lake, up in up in the Klamath and Will Harling up there. Gosh, so many mentors. <laughs> Margaret Robbins from the Cultural Fire Management Council is incredible. I love her. Um, yeah, and it it's the list just continues. But uh yeah, I've had so many incredible mentors and and that's that really drives me in my career now is just trying to pass that forward because it's it's the way that this works. <laughs> Gotta pay it's it good. forward, right? And continue to. Yep. It's like our job yeah. as like fire practitioners and fire suppression folks. I mean, firefighters, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that's our yeah. job at the end of the day is to build upon the foundation that was laid yes. before us and keep building that structure, you know, keep passing exactly. on those lessons and making it better for the future. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Hell yeah. Well, Sasha, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing a little bit about uh, Fire Forward and Audubon Canyon Ranch and your personal and professional developments that you got going on. Definitely appreciate you being on the show and I'll probably see you again here pretty soon at some of these conferences, hopefully. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for having me, Brandon. It's good to see you. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening in and Sasha, we'll get you on the show again. Yeah, talk to you soon. See you guys. And boom, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode of the Anchor Point Podcast is in the books with my good friend, Dr. Sasha Berleman. Sasha, thank you so much for coming on the show and, and uh, sharing your story and your professional insight and keep doing what you're doing. It's a pretty cool gig that you got going on over there, over at Egret, the uh, Autobahn Canyon Ranch. And if you want to find out more, if you want to follow uh, Sasha there, go and follow her on the old IG at the Fire Poppy. Go check out her stories on Mystery Ranch. She's done a bunch of stuff. They've even highlighted her as one of her uh, stories as well. And if you want to check out the Audubon Canyon Ranch, go over to www.egret, that's E-G-R-E-T dot org to find out more. Sasha, once again, thank you so much for coming on the show and keep preaching the good word of the Good Fire Movement. I definitely appreciate it. As for the rest of you, I hope everybody's doing well. And once again, go over to 
Deal Grassroots Wildland Firefighters page and the Niffy uh, pages on socials or their websites and help support the cause. It's only going to be bettering you. And for you private contractors out there, don't worry. Well, currently you're making a lot more money than uh, the uh, GS fours and fives on the ground. However, a rising tide raises all ships. So I'm sure you'll get some benefit out of it too. Anyways, Special shout out to our sponsors. We've got Mystery Ranch, purveyors of the finest damn packs in the fire game. Go over to www.mysteryranch.com and check them out and check out the Backbone Series scholarships. We've got Hotshot Brewery, kick-ass coffee for a kick-ass cause, and a portion of the proceeds will always go back to the Wildland Firefighter Foundation. Go over there and check it out for all of your good morning needs. And last but not least, we have Bethany Hanna over there at the American Wildfire Experience. So go over to www.wildfireexperience.org to check it out. And while you're at it, go check out the Smoky Generation, where you have another opportunity to uh, pursue your passions and get some grant dollars that are on the table. So once again, that is www.wildfireexperience.org. As for the rest of you, you all know the drill. Stay safe, stay savage. Peace.